to the point where we are at chapter 10. And uh, chapter 10 has to do with the angel and the little scroll. For verses 1 through 4. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun. He's a rainbow girl. And his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. Lars, <laughs> <laughs> like... Do we know what the seven thunders are? Yeah, we'll get to that here oh, okay. as we go along. Okay, first of all, this mighty angel comes down from heaven. This mighty angel is coming down from the very presence of God. He is clothed in clouds. And it, uh, it mentions uh, uh, as a chariot. Um, this comes from Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verse 3. He is clad in a cloud, and the clouds are the chariots of God, for God maketh the clouds his chariot. That's where John would have gotten that concept from. He has a rainbow over his head, and it's part of the glory of God's throne. That concept comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 28, where it says, the, if I can find it, he has a rainbow on his head, and the rainbow is part of the glory of the throne of God. Ezekiel 1, word 28, for word. word for word. Ezekiel 1, 28. The rainbow is created, apparently, by the light shining from the angel's face through the cloud. The angel's face shines like the sun, so therefore a rainbow appears above the head. The angel's voice is like a lion's roar. That's a simile for the voice of God. And I've got three scripture references here. Joel chapter 3, Hosea chapter 11, and Amos chapter 3, all three of which say... The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. So again, John is putting together all of these uh, pictures, all of the uh, symbiology from all over the uh, Old Testament. Windows 10. The angel has a foot in the sea and a, and a foot on the land. Now that represents the sum total of the world, land and sea, and shows that God's power stands as firm on the sea as it does on the land. In his hand, the angel holds a small scroll, which is open. Uh, this uh, could mean a revelation is coming. <laughs> when the angel speaks, the seven thunders sound. The, uh, since uh, Don asked about it, hello. Hold your... Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. The seven thunders are likened to the seven voices of God. That comes from Psalm chapter 29. Okay? All right. Uh, the angel speaks the seven thunders, the seven voices of God sound. Now, apparently, when the seer, John, looks at the open scroll, he is prepared to record what it says. He's ready to write it down. But he's ordered not to do it. Don't do that. It's a revelation that he is given permission to see, but he's not permitted to pass it on. Now, it's, it's of no value whatsoever to speculate about what that revelation is or was. We only know that John says he had certain experiences which he simply could not communicate to others. Take that any way you want. John may have had some thoughts or visions that he didn't even himself understand and was unable to pass well, on. I, haven't I don't know. Any of them, so you know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's a that's a possibility. Now, in, in verses five to seven, it goes on by saying, uh, 
Then the angel I had seen, standing on the sea and on the land, raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants and prophets. <sighs> this, is, this is important. Sometimes people have taken the announcement of this angel to mean time shall be no more. Time will end. <coughs> that is a completely wrong translation of the text. The proper translation means there's no time left. Mm. Meaning, you know, there's to be no more further delay as it was in this, in this particular translation. So, you know, this is important. The angel's not announcing the end of time. The angel's saying there's no more time left before certain things have got to happen. Okay. The Antichrist is about to appear in all of his destructive force. Thank you. So the scene is being set here for the final conflict between good and evil. There's no more time left. This conflict is about to take place. When this happens, the mysteries of God will be fulfilled, meaning the whole purpose of God in human history will be revealed. Good and evil will face each other in a final contest. Where? Armageddon. <laughs> Is that what we call it? No. Uh, and we'll be talking a lot more about what Armageddon really means and where it really could have been. And total victory will be won by God. All wrongs will be righted and God will triumph. Here today in modern America in our Methodist Church, we say the truth is history is moving towards the inevitable triumph of God. In the end, evil will lose. Evil cannot win. God will triumph in the end. That's the way we put it. All right. Verses 8 through 11 goes on. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, it was sour in my stomach. And then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Okay, this is the second time that the seer, who is John, is told to take the scroll, the roll. Scholars say it's important to note that it is not handed to him. He has to initiate the action and take it from the angel. This happens twice. And they say this is important because God's revelations are never forced upon mankind. You have to go for it and take it. Okay, So that's supposed to be the, the symbiology behind that right there. All of this comes from Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 the experience of Ezekiel who was told to eat the roll and fill his belly with it. That's from chapter 3, verses 1 and 3 in Ezekiel. His roll or the scroll? The scroll. Oh, you said roll, I think. Well, a roll and a scroll are the same thing, if you're, as long as you're not thinking of bisquick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A roll and a scroll. Well, you know, the roll of paper. The scroll yeah. of paper. Yeah. Yeah. The roll of papyrus. Okay. What about this thing about how sweet, <laughs> the sweetness of taste? This comes from Psalm 19 and from Psalm 119. The sweetness of the roll is a reoccurring thought in Scripture 
To the psalmist, the judgments of God are sweeter than honey and honeycomb. In Psalm 119, how sweet are thy words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Okay, so here we have the sweetness of God's word. But what happens? Sour. It turns sour. It turns the stomach sour. Um, because it's bitter. It is sweet because it is a great thing to be chosen as a messenger of God. But the message itself may be foretelling of doom and therefore a better thing. So for John, it was an infinite privilege to be admitted to the secrets of heaven. But at the same time, it was bitter to have to forecast the time of terror, even if triumph lay at the very end. That's the symbolism involved in this particular picture. You, know, you want some good news? Mm -hmm. That's the uh, end of chapter 10. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if we'd get through all of them that quick? I was just thinking, you're not even halfway through that little book of Barclay. Yeah, but uh, uh, there are two volumes of Barclay on just Revelation. Oh. <laughs> wow. So we're almost one and a half volumes through it. All right, now. It, we, we, we aren't even going to work to chapter 11, but we're not even going to start chapter 11 until next week. And there's a reason. We've got to spend some time. Chapter 11 has to do with uh, the coming of Antichrist. So we need to take some time to discuss and think about what this Antichrist thing is all about. Uh, the concept of an Antichrist has uh, exercised an enormous uh, fascination on people <laughs> uh, through all times. All kinds of theories, all kinds of speculations about the, the Antichrist. Uh, people said Stalin was the Antichrist, Hitler mm -hmm. was the Antichrist, yeah. Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist. I've heard Obama's name. Obama's the Antichrist. <laughs> There was a, what was the lady who was the uh, leader of American Atheists? Oh, um, some, I know her, I can't think of it. She that. was called an, an, the Antichrist and so on and so forth. So there's always been all kinds of speculation. People seem to be just fascinated with this idea of an Antichrist. As a general principle, okay, Antichrist stands for those powers in the universe which are against God. It is not a person, it is a concept. If you buy into that, if you buy into the fact that the Antichrist is anything that is in opposition to God, you have to swallow a pretty bitter pill. In each and every one of us, there's a small piece of Antichrist. We have all been in opposition to God in our own ways at one time or another. And so... Uh, Try to, try to get over the idea that the Antichrist for us today is a person. It is a concept. Anything that opposes God is Antichrist. What, what's the difference then between Satan and the Antichrist? What, why is there a distinction between the two? Well, <clears throat> they're similar because Satan opposes God. Yeah, he's it's the same, God, it's the same God, concept, right? Maybe He's a fallen angel that opposes God. So, see, human beings have a need to personify. So you have the concept of good, concept of evil, and so on. So we try to personify that by, by describing a person or describing a devil or describing something so that we can get a concrete picture in our mind of what this Antichrist thing is. But it's not something that really can be personified. It's, it's a concept of opposition to God. Um, Did Jesus ever refer to Satan? No. Well, yes. By name? Yeah, yes. Yes, he does. <clears throat> well, let me, let me move along here because okay. there's a concept I want to talk about, but it's, I, I need to go, go through a couple of other things first. This whole concept of Antichrist does not originate with Christianity. The word Antichrist does, but the concept of Antichrist, the concept of evil, 
being personified does not originate with the Christian church. We say, if Christ is the Holy One, then Antichrist Christ must be the unholy one. Where does it come from? Okay. Babylonian myth, way back then, in ancient Babylonia, painted all creation as a struggle between Marduk, the creator, and Tiamat, the dragon of chaos. And they believed there would come a final struggle between the two. And this idea, of course, finds its way into the Old Testament. You have Marduk and Tiamat, God and anti-God, in this huge evil and good struggle. So we come to Isaiah in the Old Testament. Hold on, Brian. Do they know when this got incorporated into the... Uh... Uh, Old Testament literature. I don't it's know the before or after the, the Babylonian exile. It would have been after, I would think. Didn't Isaiah uh, come after? Or was yeah. It? yeah. So in Isaiah, we read um, Isaiah tells of the day when God will slay the Leviathan and the crooked serpent and the dragon that is in the sea. In Jewish thought, this ancient dragon of chaos was named Rahab. Yeah, just like the lady <laughs> from Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> what we now would call sex workers. <laughs> right. So uh, here is an ancestor of the Antichrist idea. Marda or Tiamat, and then uh, Rahab. And then, uh, to take it even further... Uh, the Old Testament then begins to personify evil with the name Belial. Okay. That's in the Old Testament? Yes. Belial is the, in Jewish Old Testament writings, is the chief of all the demons. Okay. I missed that. I okay. did too. I Never missed that. Yeah. Wasn't there a priest in um, uh, the first book about name started with a B? You're talking about Baal? 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. That, was, that was a, a, a Canaanite god, I believe. Yeah, that was a god. Oh, okay. Okay, the word Belial, B-E-L-I-A-L, frequently occurs in the Old Testament. It is a synonym for evil. An evil man or woman is called a son or daughter of Belial. Eli's wicked sons are sons of Belial. That's from 1 Samuel 2, 12. When Hannah was silently praying for a child in the temple, Eli thought that she was drunk, but Hannah says that she is not a daughter of Belial. Oh, I the wicked Nabal is called a son of Belial. One of Shimei's insults was to call David a son of Belial. The false witnesses produced by Jezebel against Naboth are sons of Belial. <laughs> so, hmm. in the Old Testament... Huh? How could we have missed all those? I don't even remember the word. No, <laughs> I don't either. If I've slept that's, the that's the Jewish faith. That's right? the that's Jewish thing. Pure Jewish. And in the Old Testament, the important thing to remember here is, is that evil is being personified. Belial. This is, a, if you want to call it, an ancestor to the concept of Antichrist. Okay, this is where it's coming down through the history. Now, Persian religion which today we call Zoroastrianism. Oh, yeah. What, yeah. About, what was her name? That was one that was at Grace Church. Zoroastrian. Yeah, we had a lady that attended Grace Church what was that her was name Zoroastrian. Name? You remember. Anyway. <coughs> I can't remember whatever his name was. I Zoroastrians about, so. see the entire universe as a battleground between good and evil. You have, on the one hand, Ormuz, the god of light, fighting against Ardaman, the god of darkness. The development in Jewish history of this idea of a Messiah would eventually lead to the development of the idea of an anti-Messiah. Anti okay? If you have good, then have there's got to be evil. If you have beauty, there's got to be ugly. If you've got a Messiah, there has to be an anti-Messiah. If there is a Christ, there has to be an anti-Christ. 
So, God's anointed one would inescapably meet opposition. That opposition would become crystallized into the supreme figure of evil. Okay? It's a natural thing that, you, that people have done all through the centuries. You know? We understand what good is. Yeah, you know, we like good things. We understand what evil is. We see it all around us. But that's not good enough. We have to personify it. Well, we personify good in God and in Christ. How do we personify evil? <coughs> well, some people still do it with a little red devil with a long tail and horns running around with a pitchfork. Uh, that's a pretty childish uh, picture, but we do that sort of thing in all kinds of ways. Okay. Uh, Ezekiel, <coughs> in chapter <coughs> 3, I believe, and Zechariah, in chapter 14, both elaborate on the same kind of a struggle. And they use the, the names Gog and Magog. Oh, yeah. you, you remember those words? G-O-G yes. and M-A-G-O-G, -G, as the fight between good and evil. For later Jews, Antichrist becomes personified in a person for the first time. That person, anybody want to guess? Satan? Antiochus Lucifer. Epiphanes. Oh. oh. Antiochus Epiphanes oh, becomes oh. the very personification of the, well, Christ hadn't arrived, so it's not correct to say Antichrist, but he is the personification of Antichrist. And I think you all know why, because we've talked about this before. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes uh, conquered Israel. He invaded Palestine, captured Jerusalem. It was said, by the way, that uh, 80,000 Jews were either slaughtered, murdered, or taken into captivity. To circumcise a child or to possess a copy of the Mosaic Law was a crime punishable by death. History has seldom or never seen so deliberate an attempt to wipe out the religion of a whole people. He desecrated the temple. He erected an altar to Zeus in the most holy of holies. And on the altar in the holy of holies, he sacrificed pig's flesh. And he turned the rooms of the temple into public brothels. No wonder the Jews considered him an yeah. anti-Christ concept. Of course they did. Uh, and that continued until the revolt of the Maccabees through uh, Antiochus Epiphanes out. And that's, is that when they then found Deuteronomy hidden as a scroll? In the temple. Oh, in, yeah. In the horse quarters. Yes, I remember that. I remember yeah. that. They, 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 he, uh, he, in his purge, he had over, <laughs> overlooked some stuff. <laughs> and they found some stuff. Or this was a chance to uh, rewrite a few things. Or to rewrite, to revise a few well, things. Deuteronomy, uh, now, you know, text. Understand, very little is said about Antichrist in the New Testament. <laughs> Nothing much is said in the Gospels at all. Uh, what comments are made identifies and targets what the Gospels call false prophets and false teachers. Okay. Pretty harsh on them. And these are identified as people who who uh, by their prophesying and by their teaching lead people astray from the truth of the Gospels. Lead people uh, away from uh, Jesus Christ. However, there is a comment in 2 Thessalonians 2, 5. Let's see, where did I find that? In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul is reminding the Thessalonians of that which has been taught to them by word of mouth. Now remember, in the early churches, uh, there were a number of uh, teachings that were leading the people astray, including Gnosticism and, and the Nicolaitanism and some of the other things. And Paul identifies a person called a man of sin. 
He says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this? The picture is of a man of sin who leads the people away from God and claims that which belongs to God for himself. That's about as close as it comes to personifying Antichrist in, in the scriptures, with one exception. And that is in the letters of John, 1st and 2nd John, the Antichrist appears in 1st and 2nd John. It's in fact, hmm? Hold on while you're catching your breath there. But now Paul is told what he binds on earth is bound in heaven. No, uh, Peter, I'm sorry. Peter is told that what he buy, it binds on earth is bound in heaven. So it's Peter claimed what is God's. <laughs> Was Peter the man of sin? Uh, well, uh, Please. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. In the letters of John, it says... And it's the only place that the actual word occurs. In the last time, Antichrist is to come. In the times in which John writes, many Antichrists have come. Therefore, says John, they know that they are living in the last time. He who denies the Father and the Son is Antichrist. In particular, he who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is antichrist. Anti meaning against. Yes. So, by the time of John who writes Revelation, the uh, New Testament scriptures have defined the antichrist as the denial of the reality of the incarnation of Jesus. If you do not believe that Jesus is God incarnate. You are Antichrist. Ant Antichrist is not a person. Antichrist is anything or anyone who is anti-Christ. Okay? That makes sense. However, in Revelation, John changes. John changes everything. He paints a very detailed picture of the Antichrist. The problem is, he describes Antichrist in four or five completely different ways. Thank you, John, for helping clear up the mess. <laughs> the very first description he gives of the Antichrist is... And we will read this as we go through chapter 11. See, I'm just trying to give you a forecast of chapter 11. The beast from the abyss who will reign for 42 months. It gives the impression that the Antichrist comes from hell. So what, this, this, this beast from the abyss is going to come and reign for 42 months? What, what's the deal with the 42 months? I hope you're going to tell us. I certainly am. Oh, good. <laughs> it comes from Daniel. Daniel's picture of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes ruled Palestine for 42 months. Okay. Is that where Epiphany comes from? <laughs> I don't know. An Epiphany is a sudden... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I don't know. I don't know or not. But 42 months was the length of the period of terror and desecration of the temple. So John is painting the Antichrist as the beast from the abyss for 42 months. He's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. Then there's a second definition, and that's the great red dragon who persecutes the woman who begets the man child. Who's the woman who begets the man child? Mary. Mary. So that'd be Mary. Yes, the man child. Jesus. Yes. And this is the red dragon who persecutes the woman 
but who is ultimately defeated and cast out of heaven. This identity is clearly back to the old serpent in the Garden of Eden, the devil, oh, the, yeah. tempter. the tempter. And uh, it bears a striking resemblance also to the Babylonian concept of the dragon of chaos. Okay, The enemy of God, the evil personification against good. A third, the beast with the seven heads and ten horns which comes out of the sea. Well, John associates this with Caesar worship, persecution of the Christians, the attempt by Rome to destroy, destroy the church. Then there is the scarlet colored beast with seven heads and ten horns on which the woman called Babylon is seated. This is all coming in chapter 11. We'll talk about it in more detail. The seven heads represent the seven mountains on which the woman sits. Every time that John says Babylon, he means Rome, which was built on seven hills. Seven hills. The Antichrist comes from Rome, who unleashes persecution on the church. There is one more added definition of the Antichrist by many Christians, and it is extremely interesting. Antichrist personified by the early Christian church becomes the Emperor Nero. The worst of the Roman emperors in the early days was Nero, who regarded as the supreme, who was regarded as the supreme monster of iniquity, not only by the Christians, but also by the Romans themselves. <clears throat> you know, he's the one that burnt Rome and played the fiddle while Rome burned and then blamed the Christians for the whole thing. Nero died by suicide in A.D. 68. There went up a huge sigh of relief from everyone. He was a perverted sick sucker. I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> he died by suicide. But almost immediately there arose the belief that he was not dead at all. Oh, well, and that he was waiting in Parthia to descend on the world with the terrible hordes of the Parthian cavalry to loose destruction and terror upon the entire world. That idea is called the Nero Redivivus. Nero resurrected. Nero come back from the dead. He was so evil, you see. In the ancient world, it was widespread more than 20 years after Nero was dead. To the Christians, Nero was a figure of concentrated evil. It was he who had put the blame of the great fire on Rome on the Christians. It was he who had initiated persecution. It was he who had found the most savage methods of torture. Many Christians in the early church believe in the Nero Redivivus myth. And frequently, as in certain parts of Revelation, Nero Redivivus and Antichrist are identified as the same thing. And the Christians thought of the coming of Antichrist in the terms of returning of Nero. Suffice it to say, John is not describing some mythological antichrist that is yet to come in the year 2050. He identifies Rome and Nero as antichrist. And he was absolutely, positively correct. Rome and the emperors were anti-Christ. <laughs> they were against Christ. But people today are constantly looking for the Antichrist to show up. Uh, the Antichrist's arrival today is supposed to be the announcement of the end of time and all the rest of this stuff. And if, if you have a Christian brother or sister who is conservative enough to, to be looking for the Antichrist's arrival, uh, I would tell them, you know, I hate to disappoint you, but Antichrist uh, existed 2,000 years ago and has been long dispensed with. But for the early Christians in the early church, it was real. 
It was real. Although there is antichrist going on today. Of course in there the is. World. Of course there is. Uh, Satan still exists. The devil is real. And all of that is to say evil is real. Yeah. Evil exists. We can, I mean, look at what's going on just the last couple of weeks. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's evil. And all of it certainly uh, opposed to, uh, to Christ. Now, just one more quick comment before we wrap up today so that we can start right into chapter 11 next week. <coughs> chapter 11. Folks, we're really up against it. Uh, with good reason, it's been called the most difficult chapter in the whole book of Revelation to understand. You think it's been bad to this point? You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> At the same time, it has been identified as the most important chapter in the book of Revelation. The difficulty comes from a whole bunch of different passages of which there are very serious interpretation problems. And uh, there's no real certainty, even among all the best scholars, of, of what it all means. So it'll, it'll take some doing to get through this. The importance in the chapter, however, lies in the fact that it contains a deliberate summary of all the rest of the chapters in Revelation. So that makes it an important chapter. And uh, here are the thing. Here are the uh, five things that Chapter Eleven does. First of all, we talk about the measuring and sealing of the temple. Then the two heralds of the end. The emergence of Antichrist. Restoration, repentance, and conversion of the Jews. And final triumph of Christ, resulting in a 1,000 year reign. Okay, can't All wait. Right. Wow. Chapter 11 will be fun. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> we'll probably end up being Thank totally you, confused by the time but it's we'll over. Never <laughs> <laughs> probably, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no more